Friends, the Lord be with you. Grace and peace to all of you in the name of Jesus Christ as we gather on this beautiful day to wait and watch for the coming of our Lord. Friends, it is indeed a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord and we are glad that all of you are here. We have some uh, wonderful announcements to make this morning, the first of which is that we have some new members to welcome to the church. And gratefully, they are moving already down to the front of the sanctuary, which is perfect. Don't even sit down, guys. Come on up. It was the distinct joy, uh, joyful act of the, the session this morning to meet about 10.30 uh, to welcome into membership two families, and we are thrilled, uh, thrilled to welcome them this day. Uh, I want to welcome uh, Benjamin Perry and Kaylee Shehai and their kids, Colton, Liam, and Addie Grace. Now, they've been visiting with us for quite some time and have, uh, after a while, we've been talking and they have jo uh, decided to join our membership and we are thrilled uh, to have y'all. The kids have been an active part of things and we've, we've seen Ben and uh, Kaylee here at a lot of stuff too and we are thrilled that y'all are a part of our congregation. Uh, they're going to be joining by transfer of letter from another uh, church in the community uh, up in Simpsonville and we are thrilled uh, that y'all are here. We also want to welcome this day uh, William and Marion Crawford, who are joining as affiliate members. They, uh, they are splitting time between Lawrence and Greenville, uh, where they have their primary residence, but they're down here a lot. And uh, when they're down here, they worship with us. And in the Presbyterian Church, we allow for what's known as affiliate membership, so you can have uh, an attachment to the place where you worship when you're not uh, in necessarily your hometown. And so we are thrilled that y'all have chosen to do that. And uh, it's also a time that we can thank William uh, again for being part of our music program last week with their daughter McCoy. Uh, and uh, I think if you were here last week and you saw them on piano and uh, violin, uh, you knew how special that was too. They will be joining me in the narthex as we dismiss from worship this day uh, so that you can give them a more personal welcome and shake their hand or give them a hug. So we are thrilled that y'all are with us and y'all can go back to your seats. We have more uh, joyful news to share. Many of you already know this, but and we'll have the rose next week. Uh, we've talked to Leslie and Presbyterian women will be coordinating that, but it's, it's never too soon to announce good news, and the good news that we can announce today is that Hannah and John Coleman and Wright and Webb welcomed Cameron James Coleman to the world on Friday morning. Uh, he weighed seven pounds, 12 ounces. Uh, I had the wonderful opportunity to go and see him on Friday afternoon, and he slept through the entire thing just very peacefully. Uh, he was already making himself very comfortable. Uh, Mom and Dad were thrilled and doing great. So uh, we celebrate their joyful welcoming of Cameron James uh, this, this Friday and into our community of faith as well. Finally, I have one, uh, one announcement related to the shoebox ministry that our, our, uh, that our church has been a part of for many years. Uh, been given the official tallies on those things. We had a group that went up to Charlotte for the, for the, for the packing this week, and uh, they wanted us to know that this year, uh, our church was sort of the coordinating hub, as, as it always is, that this year uh, they took up 1,500 shoeboxes, which is a new record, and 215 from our own church. Is that a record for our church, too? Record for our church, too, so a big year for that. Uh, and they were able to be there on Monday when the one millionth box was packed. Um, did, they, did they notify which one was the one millionth box? Did they hold it? It's kind of like the one billionth hamburger that, that uh, McDonald's did years ago. You knew it was happening somewhere, you're just not sure which one. But anyway, it's a great thing, and thanks to everybody that participated in that. Uh, it's part of our wide range of mission opportunities here at First Presbyterian, and we're glad to, be, to have been a longstanding partner uh, with the Shoebox program. Uh, we're also grateful for all of the other mission opportunities that are there, and we hope in the new year that everyone will take opportunity to be a part of 
uh, just one of our mission opportunities. We'll talk more about that after the turn of the year. Friends, those are all of our announcements this day, so let us again turn our hearts and our minds to God's worship. Watch, wait for the coming Christ. Like candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for peace. <coughs> Hear God's promise of peace from Isaiah 11, 1 through 10. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of the, his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and eyes that see, or decide what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and the decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall lie down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, 
and the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play with the ho in, over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put down his hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my mountain, for the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the people. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Let us pray. Faithful God, you are at work to restore all of creation in its intended harmony. Give us your shalom that we may be reconciled to all enemies in the peace that passes all understanding through Christ Jesus our Lord. God of promise, God of hope, into our darkness come. Amen. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. <coughs> this is the season of holy waiting. We wait for the one who will tear open the heavens and come down to save us. We watch for the day when God's name will be made known among the nations. We wait in the shadows for the light of the world to appear. Come, let us walk in the light of God. And our hymn as we praise God is 159, O Sing a Song of Bethlehem.
Friends, if we say that we are without sin, then we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So before God and neighbor, let us confess our sins first in unison and then in silence. Refining God, you have sent us prophets and we have not listened. We have not always determined what is best or made way for your reign in our lives, our church and our society. Forgive us, we pray. Renew your covenant within us and grant us your peace. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is the good news of this Advent season that even as we wait in darkness... The light of the world comes to shine in and amongst us. The good news that we celebrate, friends, is that in Christ we find our redemption and our salvation. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Friends, you may be seated. If the children will come forward, please. Good morning. morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. Well, first of all, y'all did a really good job on the tree last week. A lot of y'all helped out with that. That was a fantastic job. I think we'll all agree we have a good-looking tree. Yep. People back there are nodding. Everybody thinks so. It's a good-looking tree. And Noah, where's Noah? Noah, nice job lighting the candles this morning. Thank you. Good job with that. So today, we're going to talk about a guy in church named John the Baptist. Anybody ever heard of him? What do we know about John? That's right. He, that was his occupation. He was a baptizer. That's why they called him John the Baptist. And he baptized people in the Jordan River, and he baptized Jesus. He did all of that. You, want to, what, you know what else is interesting about John? John was a cousin of Jesus's. Did you know that? Now, I'm, I'm not sure they were first cousins exactly. I'm not sure how close, but we're pretty sure they were cousins. That's what the Bible tells us. It doesn't say exactly first. Or has, Anybody got cousins? Y'all got cousins? I'm going to talk to y'all about cousins here in a minute. I got some cousins, too. Do you like your cousins? All right, some of your cousins might be, like, right here close by. So it's cool to have cousins, right? Because they, you can play with them, you can do some things with them. They give you a different... They're, they're, they're family. They're like the best friends you can have. They're family and they're friends. That's the cool thing about cousins. Well, John's job was to let everybody know about a lot of good things about turning away from sin, but to let them know that somebody in his family was coming along, that Jesus was coming, and that Jesus, as as neat as the stuff John was doing by baptizing people, that Jesus was going to come and do all kinds of better things with them. John said, I'm going to baptize you in, in the river with water, but the one that's coming after me, and he didn't tell me he was his cousin, but he knew. Well, eventually he knew. Anyway, he 
He's going to baptize you with fire and with the Holy Spirit. That it's going to be even a bigger deal than being baptized with water. That when this one comes along, you're really going to know what's right in the world. Now, John was an interesting guy. You know, remember any, anybody remember how John dressed? How'd he dress? Yeah, he, wouldn't, he didn't dress like normal folks, did he? He dressed like wore animal skins and he ate like locusts and wild, he ate bugs, y'all. He ate bugs. This was not normal even back in Jesus' time. Everybody pointed at him and said, look at that guy wearing the animal skins, eating the honey and the bugs. But they listened to him and he had positive things to say about Jesus coming. And so what he said he was doing was making the way straight for what Jesus would do. So y'all are going to learn more about him, I'm sure, uh, as we go on. But John the Baptist is who we're going to talk about today. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for teaching us about Jesus with all kinds of interesting people that point the way towards him. Amen.
Friends, let's join our hearts and our minds in prayer. Holy and loving God, we pray that your spirit will move among us in the word that is read and the word that is proclaimed this day. We pray this day for a world that still knows hunger, a world that still knows pain, a world that still knows violence, and a world that still waits with anxious hope for your coming. We pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you will teach us how to feed the hungry, that you will teach us how to make peace, that you will teach us how to comfort one another. We pray this day, Lord, that you will be among us, that you will let us know your presence, that you will let us hear your voice in this Advent season so that we may focus our eyes and our hearts and our minds solely on you. And so it is, Lord, that even as our deepest prayers don't pass our lips, you hear them still, for you know us through and through. And we come to you boldly to pray the prayer that you teach us to pray over and over again. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our Old Testament reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah. You'll hear echoes of the words you heard when we lit our Advent candle earlier. I'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. Hear now God's word to us this day. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide but by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, and their young shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the Lord will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day... The root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nation shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our gospel reading this morning is from Matthew's gospel. I'll be reading the account of John the Baptist baptizing at the Jordan River. Hear now God's word to us today from Matthew chapter 3 verses 1 through 12. In those days, John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness of Judea proclaiming, pro, proclaiming repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is the one of whom the prophet Isaiah spoke when he said, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John wore clothing of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. And then the people of Jerusalem and all Judea were coming out to him and the region all along the Jordan and they were baptized by John in the river Jordan confessing their sins. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism he said to them you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit worthy of repentance. Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now the axe is lying at the root of the trees, Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but one who is more powerful than I is coming after me, and I'm not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Friends, this is the Lord, word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, a few moments ago, I asked the kids, the children, if they had cousins, and almost every hand went up when I did that. We all have cousins. Not all of us, but most of us have cousins. But think for a minute with me. We all have somebody in the family. Maybe it's a cousin. Maybe it's an in-law. Maybe it's a distant aunt or uncle. Maybe you just saw them at Thanksgiving. Maybe you'll see them soon at Christmas. But everybody's got a cousin. We'll just use a cousin as a catch-all term here. Everybody's got a cousin that you're not sure about, right? Everybody's got a cousin in the family that shows up at the family gatherings, and they, maybe they wear different clothes. Maybe they, you know, maybe they won't eat turkey at Thanksgiving, but they eat like all the cranberry sauce. Maybe they talk about things that, you really wish they wouldn't talk about it at the table? Or maybe they just corner you and talk about things that are ridiculously unimportant, but you can't seem to get away from them. Everybody's got a cousin in the family that's just a little bit, at least in the South, everybody in the family, or every family has somebody, a cousin, an aunt, an uncle, somebody that's just a little odd. Help me out here, is that right? Okay, a little nod. You don't have to say anything, but you can nod your head. Now, if you are sitting there thinking, well, gee, Mike, you've wasted four minutes of my time here. I, I don't have anybody in my family like that. Well, I have some bad news for you. <laughs> You're that person. <laughs> but it's okay. It's okay because it's family. That's how it works. Some of you are, just came to a shocking revelation. <laughs> and even within those strange people in a family, there's some folks in the family that when they show up, it doesn't matter if it's been forever since you've seen them, when they show up, 
they just sort of make things better. They make you feel all right. They say the right thing. They do the right thing. Well, John the Baptist is not that guy. John the Baptist is not the person in Jesus' family. He's, not, he's the long-lost cousin I was talking about before. He's the odd one at the family gatherings. He's the guy standing off to himself at the Thanksgiving dinner. You, you, you wonder it, how he even got dressed up that day. That's what the account is telling us. John is the odd guy, and he's saying the odd things out on the outskirts of Jerusalem. John dresses funny. He wears camel's hair and an odd leather belt. He doesn't dress like normal folk, even for first century uh, Jerusalem. He eats bugs, locusts, and honey. And he says the things to people that you can't imagine anybody saying. Things that might not just be odd, they can be challenging and they can be insulting. But on this second Sunday of Advent, John is exactly the guy we need. John is essential to our Advent journey. John is the one that is telling us what we need to hear as we journey along the way to the manger. John is necessary. You see, John is necessary because John comes into the narrative as we follow along, and John is talking about repentance. Now, it may feel a little bit odd that we're talking about repentance here in the middle of Advent. We should be talking about the arduous trek that Mary and Joseph are making their way to Bethlehem along the way, and we'll get to that. We could be talking about the season and how the season warms our hearts and how this is the most wonderful time of the year and all of that. And here John is, out in the wilderness, breaking into our narrative that we enjoy, so to speak, talking about repentance. How does that fit with our notion of the second Sunday that is the Sunday of peace? We'll come to that in just a minute. But while we're talking about odd things, while we're talking about strange things, while we're talking about odd things to preach about or talk about, what does a brood of vipers look like anyway? And I've done some research, and I've got some bad news for us. Now, Matthew's gospel that we read today, John is out preaching in the wilderness. He's baptizing people, and he specifically points out, he sees the Sadducees and the Pharisees coming down from Jerusalem, and he singles them out, and he says, You brood of vipers, who warned you to get out of the way of God's wrath? Now, I had a typo in the vine. I said it was Mark's gospel. It's actually Luke's gospel where John actually doesn't just single out the Sadducees and the Pharisees. When In Luke's gospel, the way it's accounted for, he speaks to the whole crowd. He's talking to all of them that gathered down around the river to be baptized and says, You brood of vipers! More bad news. You know, sometimes I will research the Greek and I'll research the Hebrew for you and say, you know, the way we've translated it all these years really means something different than you might think. There's a different spin on it. I got nothing for brood of vipers. It was just as insulting back then as you might expect it to be now. It was not a compliment, it was not saying they were crafty. It was meant to be pejorative and insulting to them. It was meant to put them down. It was meant to call them what he thought they were, a bunch of sinful folks. Now, it's interesting. This was right before we really start to see baptism happening. Uh, 
in the New Testament or right as we're seeing it happening. And I've got with me this morning uh, some books that we use from time to time in our order of worship. This is an old one. This is a book of common order. This is John Knox's order. Uh, I got this from Scotland. This is an old one, and it's got all the baptismal uh, formulas that go back really the 19th century uh, baptismal formulas that they used there. This is my handbook of uh, common worship. I use this for weddings and baptisms and other things, except now the print's gotten so small that my glasses don't do me justice, so I have to do, make other arrangements, but it looks good. And this is the big book of common worship. And I show you all these things to let you know that we have in these books all of the baptismal formulas that the Presbyterian Church uses and has used. And not a single one of them it says, Welcome, brood of vipers, it's a good time to be baptized. <laughs> not a single one of them says, Come, you sinful snake, let me put water on you to make things better. We're a little more inviting. We're a little more congenial when we do things. And so you might be thinking, wow, it's two weeks before Christmas. And we're out here with John talking about snakes. But the question John asks is essential to what we are about being an Advent. The question John asks, the action that he's undertaking, the call that John's voice makes to us is absolutely important. Now, at least for our Advent journey. Now, I'm going to stop short of calling our congregation, myself included, or anybody personally, a brood of vipers. That's just not good practice right here as we're trying to close out the year. But, if we are all honest, if we're all honest, folks, we know that we all have our slithering tendencies. We know that sin is a present part of our lives. And we know it on the kind of level that says that nobody knows our own sins better than ourselves. We look in the mirror and we know where we fall short. And so it is that we can, knowing this, situate ourselves right there with the crowd, not just the Sadducees and the Pharisees. We fool ourselves if we think the brood of vipers simply belongs to other folks. We're right there in the midst of them, present and sinfully accounted for. And I think it's an absolutely essential part of Advent that we claim that and we own it. Because, friends, part of welcoming a Savior in the first place is to understand that we are in need of one. And we fool ourselves if we say we're not. We talk from the first chapter of John about the light shining in the darkness and the darkness not overcoming it. Well, folks, the reason we are hopefully anticipating the Christ child is because we need the Christ child. We need the light to shine into our darkness. We need the light to come and brighten up our lives and to teach us how to deal with our sin. The gathered crowd knew it. But what they didn't know, what they couldn't have realized down by the Jordan River, was that one was mingling in there right among them, one who was coming to be baptized himself, one who came down amongst the brood of vipers, as John called them, was Jesus himself. Jesus was right there amongst them in the crowd, waiting to be baptized himself, not because he needed it, but because we needed 
Him. Because we continue to need Him. He tells John that the reason that he is coming to be baptized is to fulfill all righteousness. Because John knows that Jesus has no need of repentance. What's happening down there, this extraordinary scene at the Jordan River with John calling people a brood of vipers and people still standing in line, not being offended and walking away, but knowing on some level that he was right, that they needed to repent of their sins. They needed something to give them a fresh start and a fresh lease on their lives. And yet there was even more coming. We call it in this season of hope, this season of Advent, we call it Emmanuel, the name of God with us. And it's important on this Sunday of Advent to remember that Jesus, the grown man Jesus, about to begin his ministry, Jesus is there amongst the throng of people desperately in need of a Savior. Another way to look at it is this, and you can see uh, the words I leave for you in the bulletin this week. John and the Jesus he announces arrive with the most astonishing combination of acceptance and admonition. We all discover this Advent not only that we are cherished for who we are, but we are responsible for what we do. This can be good Advent news because if God doesn't care what I do, then I will begin to suspect that God does not actually care about me. And what's not quoted there in your bulletin, David Bartlett goes on to say, If God loves me enough to welcome me into Christ's family, then God loves me enough to expect something from me. If God loves us enough to welcome us into the body of Christ, then God loves all of us enough to expect something of us. You see, repentance is not the condition of the gift. So much as the repentance, the opportunity to repent, the opportunity to turn away from the sinful life and towards the redeemed life in Christ, that is part of the gift of Christ coming into the world as our Savior. And that is the part that gives way to peace. For when, it's, when we're able to truly turn away, slowly but surely, from our sinful lives, that's when we are able to own the freedom that Christ's redemption brings to us. That's when we're truly able to own the grace that Christ brings to us. It's the peace of knowing that with the admonition, with the expectation of living into what God has created us to do, we have God's assurance of being accepted. It's not a condition. It's part of the gift itself. It's the peace of knowing that slowly but surely we will free ourselves or be freed by God's redemption, by the ongoing sanctification of our lives, that we will eventually be freed completely of our slithering tendencies, even though we're not there yet. It's the peace of knowing that At the point that we most desperately needed a Savior, the Savior was there amongst the crowds and stands amongst us for the sake of righteousness, for the sake of grace, for the sake of God's deep and abiding love of the world that God came to be with us. In Bethlehem, and in Lawrence, and in your house too. That's the good news of this Advent Sunday.
the good news that we can be called to repentance, we can be expected to be part of God's kingdom, and we can claim God's love and redemption and grace. In the name of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer, Amen. Friends, I invite you to rise with me as we affirm the faith into which we stand this day. We'll use the ancient words of the Apostles' Creed to affirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. Friends, the Apostle Paul calls us to make our worship, our lives, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice for the one who came and sacrificed himself for us. So let us now give of our tithes and offerings and prayerfully consider how as we leave this place, we can go into the world to be the hands and the feet of the body of Christ. Let us do this now. Friends, let us pray. Holy and loving God, we pray that you will take these gifts and make them more than simple offerings, but take them and put them to work in the building of your kingdom. 
We pray that you will take us also and make us co-builders with you in the building of your kingdom in this place, that we may serve all whom we encounter. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our hymn is hymn number 378, We Wait the Peaceful Kingdom. This may not be a familiar hymn, so I'm going to ask the choir to sing the first verse and ask you to join in on the remaining verses, please. 378. Friends, go from this place in peace, knowing that the peace that comes from redemption is the peace that helps us truly own the grace that comes to us in Jesus Christ. So friends, go out into the world in peace, have courage, hold on to that which is good, and return no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, and help the suffering. Honor all people, love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now the grace, mercy, and peace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with us all this day, this holy season of Advent, and forever. Amen.